recording, so I think uh, if you want to make it interactive, throw the microphone to whoever wants to ask questions. Okay. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm David Jazz Myers. Um, I, uh, I've done some things in uh, what I consider to be categorical systems theory, which is the use of category theory to um, study uh, dynamical systems seen broadly. That I think is a whole like sort of subfield of, of applied category theory. And so one of the sort of things, that, I guess this is one of the motivations to have these tutorials is that applied category theory is actually fairly broad because our idea is that we're gonna take a category theory and apply it to anything. And so there ends up being lots of little subdomains. And so one of the one of the reasons for these tutorials, as I understand it, is that uh, you know you go to all these talks, and a lot of times you see sort of similar talks year after year. There's sort of trends, not similar, but like in the same topics. And uh, and so we wanted to make it uh, available to learn into some of these things. However, the problem is that there's sort of a fractal nature to this, which is that even e each of these subdisciplines also has subdisciplines, and e just as in category theory, our examples tend to also have examples. So. Um, so what you're going to see today is a very narrow point of view on lenses. And I see some, some lens gurus in the room um, who uh, have a, a sort of a different uh, uh, perspective. And there are also people who are in here might have used some, done some functional programming. And that's also a different perspective. And I'm going to go through these. So I just want to let you know that this is just a one guy's point of view on lenses. And uh, in particular, we're going to tie them into to categorical systems theory. So as far as the, the structure of this, I'm going to go through, I'm going to talk a little. Um, and then there are going to be little uh, pink bubbles on the side, and they will correspond to exercises. Now, I do not know if the exercises are available online in like two seconds. Don't worry, we have, we have time before the, they come up. But, if, but then they're, like, they're going to be a number. That number corresponds to an exercise. We're going to work on that. Um, and as part of the thing, and uh, uh, before I go on, so the, the talk is sort of, or the, the work, the, whatever this is, sort of structured um, uh, so that we could either spend all the time on the first half or half the time on the first half. Uh, and it depends uh, on what people want to do and how long we're working on those uh, examples and how interesting they are. But could I get a show of hands? I want to, I'm going to ask a question. The show of hands, do you know some concept? I want you to, like, if you don't know the concept, that's the most important thing for me to know. So, I, in fact, I want show of hands if you don't know the concept um, or don't feel very comfortable with the concept. I don't want you to feel like you're left out for not knowing it. I introduce it. My question is, like, how, how much do I spend on introducing it and how much do I spend on, you know, blowing through it and doing, you know, using category lingo? So, please. This, could, you, could I get a raise of hands? Have you heard of the Grothian deconstruction and do you feel comfortable with it? Uh, for or against? Okay. <laughs> are you comfortable, are you not comfortable with the Grothian deconstruction is maybe the data I want. Okay, great, good. Okay, so, um, uh, so uh, we're gonna see if we, if, we, uh, if we get there and how much we do on it um, when that happens, but uh, that's helpful for me to know. Okay, so uh, lenses are, a, are in general a kind of bi-directional transformation. So in category theory, we focus on usually on some kind of transformation. And uh, a transformation for me is a map or an arrow, a category. So here's a transformation. I've written it up in two different notations. F from A to B, um, that's, that's the arrow notation. And then down here I have the string diagram notation. Um, where we have, it's, it's sort of the, the Poincaré dual, where now what was a point, that A, becomes a wire that we imagine carrying the data of whatever element or whatever thing is in there. And then the F, the function, in the arrow notation, it was something like one-dimensional, like an arrow, and now it's something zero-dimensional, it's a box that lives at a point. Um, and we think of it as a black box that transforms the information carried on the A wire and turns it into something that can be carried on the B wire. So this is just transformation. A bidirectional transformation is effectively just a pair of maps, one which goes forward and one which goes backwards. Um, so I've written them up here. 
uh, uh, I'm going to use plus for the forward direction and minus for the backward direction in this talk. And now this kind of string diagram here is actually written in a very, uh, so this is kind of a, I'm, I, I, I had a lot of the talk in these string diagrams and then I sort of removed them all. So this is the last one. We don't need to learn it too much. But you will see some of these in the, um, in the lens literature. And there, I wanted to point out that they're divided in half. The bottom one flows this way and the top one flows that way. So it's not a normal string diagram. But the point is here, you can see that we have two things, A's and B, A, A's, A's flowing down and A minuses, which flow upstream. And then the B's also are similarly split. And then we have these two kind of maps, one which flows downstream and one which flows upstream. Now, this is not a single definition of a lens. This is not a definition of anything. The, this is a schematic for bidirectional transformations. In general, there's more going on. In fact, there's usually relationships between these two kinds of flows. And a lens is a particular kind of relationship that these two kinds of flows can have. I saw some questions. Oh, yeah, that's a typo. Thank you. Which I can correct. Oop, right now. Yes, I do. OK, so what makes a lens out of a bidirectional transformation? Well, a lens is a bidirectional transformation where specifically the domain of the backwards flow depends on the, the actual function that is the forwards direction flow. This is the point of view I will be taking. It is a specific point of view on lens. I have a, my next slide is going to be all the different things people have called lens. But this uh, is a particular point of view of lens that we're going to look at. So this is a particular kind of relationship that the backwards flow has to the forwards flow. So bidirectional information flow happens everywhere. I'll talk about that in a little bit. But this is the schematic. For now, this is just a schematic. Yeah. Um, not that I know of specifically, but it is, it is a similar sort of idea where you have these, these pairing directions of flows. Sense, yeah. Um, okay, uh, yeah, and, and this is great, by the way. This kind of like stopping me and asking me questions is really great, and uh, please keep doing it. So, okay. Um, great, so lens as a name, as an idea, does not denote a single thing. There's no consensus on what makes a lens, which is a little kind of irritating. Um, hopefully we're starting to converge to various kinds of notions, but it's been a long, there's a, 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 variety, a constellation of related ideas and uh, uh, notions that are obviously related and sometimes formally related, um, but they're not exactly the same. And since that they're all slightly different, everyone just calls them a this kind of lens or a that kind of lens, and then we get increasingly long and complicated names for lenses. But as far as I'm concerned with the original notion of lenses are lawful lenses, sometimes known as very lawful lenses. And, uh, uh, and these were designed in order to solve what's known as the view update problem in programming. And the idea of the bidirectional flow there is that you have some kind of big data structure and you want to look at some part of that data structure. Maybe you want to display something to the screen. Now there's a bunch of information you need to know, but I only want to display part of it. But then the user can interact with it, and I want their interaction with that part to get passed back to the whole thing. So I view it, and then I update it. And that is a bi-directional transformation. The viewing goes out of the computer to you, the updating comes out of you and goes back to the computer. And that's the original sort of idea, and the laws that they're meant to satisfy are, sort of, I actually have them in, uh, in one of the exercises, the laws that those things are meant to satisfy are meant to make sure that that picture makes sense. That was the original sort of thing that was called a lens. I think it's 2003, so I don't know if, I'm sure that there's a, there's a deep history in here. Um, there will be eventually a reading list put on. And the first link in that, which I did not annotate with the names for links, but the first link in that reading list is a blog post by Jules Hedges called Lenses for Philosophers, which is effectively a little history of the concept of lens. Um, it's, I think it's pretty useful to just keep, uh, keep track of the wide variety of things that people have called lens over the years. Okay, so um, 
So uh, we have uh, uh, some, uh, some people here who work on another variant of lawful lenses. This is a much more involved variant. It's, mu it's a generalization of that one. I would say it's, it's uh, uh, maybe the most general in this category that I have listed up here. I don't know. Um, uh, well, you can argue with Kofi. Um, it's called delta lenses. I'm not going to talk about delta lenses, but delta lenses are called such because they also allow for deltas, which is to say, to keep track of not just like what the next, what the completely new thing you update to, but what is the delta that you, how it is the change you had to make in your update. That's sort of the idea. Again, not going to talk about it. Cofunctors are an idea that actually came from like, uh, you know, geometry. There was a a notion of a cofunctor developed for Lie groupoids. And, uh, and it, it, it sort of uh, turns out that it's actually a very useful and common notion that's happened in, in category theory. And here is the world, if you've heard of like polynomial functors, and uh, Nelson's right there, we have David Spivak somewhere. Um, we have uh, that world um, of polynomial functors and polynomial comonads, as it turns out, a, more, a comonad morphism between polynomial comonads is the same thing as a cofunctor between categories, which is weird. Again, I'm not covering this, okay? You don't need to, those words are crazy. You don't, whoo, right over. All right. So the, the point is that all of these things, and then polymorphic lenses, so this is another thing I'm not covering. Um, the lenses really blew up in, in functional programming. And I would say that that's the number one use that lenses have. And absolutely, a talk on lenses should focus on their uses in functo functional programming, because that's what people actually use them for. However, I'm not a, much of a programmer, and I don't really know how to give that talk. So I'm not going to. But I, I <laughs> would let you know that that's probably the main use, and it's used for data access and update and making them, them really good. And uh, so polymorphic lenses are, uh, are a, well, a particular, maybe an attitude that you can take towards the lenses that they use in, say, Haskell. And they've now propagated to other sorts of functional programming languages. Um, and Haskell is also the root of a number of really interesting implementations of the concept of lens, namely uh, 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 von Larhoven lenses and Profunctor lenses. Um, and that leads to the whole subfield of optics. Uh, this is not an optics talk, but we see a lot of optics talks at uh, ACT, which is great because it's really cool. Optics are, are a generalized form of uh, bidirectional transformation. So all of those things we're not going to talk about. The second list are the so-called outlaw lenses or lawless lenses. All of these ones up top have some axioms, effectively, governing the relationship between the forward and backward directions. The ones on the bottom have no relationship. They are effectively just two independent maps. That they're related in the way I said, which is that the domain of the backwards map depends on the forwards map. But that's it. They're otherwise they're independent. And these, uh, we have a number of, of, of variants of them, but they're all special cases of this one kind, which is going to be sort of the focus here, if we, maybe if we get to it, called functor lenses. And that's by uh, uh, David Spivak. Um, uh, uh, it's a short, short little paper. And if you know what the Grothendi construction is, I'll tell you right now the definition of, if you're like a, you know, if this is all old hat, I can tell you the definition of a functor lens in one sentence, which is one of these fun category things you get to do that's always enjoyable, um, which is that the, the category of lenses associated to an index category is the Grothendi construction of its pointwise opposite. And at the very end of this thing, if we, if I feel that we're like having, you know, we've already had our fun with the so-called simple lenses at the bottom of this list, we'll see how that works. But that's, that's, the, that's the main takeaway here. So, okay, so these include various kinds of other lenses. So simple lenses are the kinds of lenses you actually see in Haskell, uh, as I'm going to call them. Sometimes people use simple lens to mean something else. I'll have you note also that the, I make a convention choice, which is opposite to much of the literature, but for good reason. Um, I'm not even going to tell you what it is. I'll tell you what it is later. I'll tell you what it is when you're older. Okay. Um, so, uh, right. So, okay. So, there are a lot of things called lenses. Luckily, the functor lenses part, the lawless lenses, as far as I know, every kind of lawless lens is a certain kind of functor lens. Um, I would love to know if that's not the case, but here's one really cool feature. The laws that you usually have for the lenses do not really type check at all for functor lenses, 
which is sort of a tell that functor lenses are the concept for lawless lenses. So there's really like two concepts that happen to be called the same thing, which is lens. But in a sense that the functor lenses are really getting at the idea of lenses without laws, whatever that means. Okay? So this is, in, a, in other words, these are the kinds of lenses that aren't used to solve the view update problem. It's another way to think about it. And we'll see the uses there. So our focus today is on functor lenses. Our real focus, maybe I should say, is on um, simple lenses, which is our special case. And when you say lens um, to like a Haskell programmer, they mean simple lens, but they mean it done in a different implementation than how we will do it. Okay, so these are the applications of the concept of lens. Um, and uh, I'd say these are some of the applications of the concept of lens. Um, the main thing uh, is solving the view update problem. So that was the original thing that they were defined for. And uh, the giving a uh, notion of data access and update and database management in functional programming. Um, and uh, uh, now uh, sort of the, the lawless lenses there's second wave lens theory is uh, showing up in categorical approaches to a variety of topics, namely uh, machine learning um, in this paper by Fon, Fong, uh, Spivak, and Tieris, uh, open games in the, uh, like, I guess, Ghani Hedges et al. Um, uh, uh, sector here, and controlled dynamical systems. And, uh, and so our focus today will be on they're used for dynamical systems. And I'll say, so I have, a, I have a book draft on this topic, and the content of these lectures is effectively chapters one and two, if you want a longer form version of these. You can think of them as lecture notes. All right, so uh, that's the lens family. Those are the applications. Um, uh, so maybe I can uh, point out here that the category theorist's famous uh, favorite image um, so, you know, the lens elephant right there, right? We're gonna be one of these people today, and we're gonna look at just one aspect of the theory of lenses. And I, I just wanna emphasize that this is just sort of my angle on it using the motivation of dynamical systems. And of course, not all dynamical systems, just some of them, which I'll go into. Um, and, uh, and yet, so lenses also are at the center of a lot of, a lot of uh, various kinds of category theory. So there's a lot of little angles. So if dynamical systems aren't your thing, I encourage you to take a look at the links of further reading. And there are other things you might find interesting in lens theory. And, uh, and yeah, okay. So that's gonna be the beginning. Are there any questions before I uh, get to this dense, in, in like super dense slide? Cool. All right. So uh, yeah. So I, I I need to set the stage a little bit um, with uh, what I mean by systems theory here. So this is sort of my take on uh, on on categorical systems theory. If you're familiar with the concept from categorical logic of doctrines, this I take the word from Levere, who is the gives his name to the password for this Zoom call, um, <laughs> among other things. <laughs> um, <laughs> So uh, a doctrine is a theory of what it means to be a theory of systems. It's a second order level. So um, what do I mean by a theory of systems? Well, we have things like, you know, maybe we say a system of ODEs, ordinary differential equations. This is maybe what the vast majority of people who say system mean by systems. We also have systems of linear equations or systems of other kinds of equations. We also have, uh, you know, uh, uh, deterministic finite automata and more machines and various generalizations of that sort. Markov decision processes. Um, uh, also, we have things like Ham Port Hamiltonian graphs uh, and, uh, you know, Hamiltonian Lagrangian systems, um, various other kinds of things. Almost everything has been called a system at some point. But they are generally organized, in my view, in, in sort of three different ways. And as categorical systems theorists, we have three different mathematical technologies for dealing with these. Um, so the first idea is that a system is, and this is rather, some, most people wouldn't call these systems, but rather sort of pictures of systems, um, is a diagram or a graph that is labeled in some or other ways. And the way we compose those kinds of systems is that we glue them together. So we just take our pictures and they maybe have different parts and we put some of the parts together and that gives us a bigger picture. Um, and the categorical tool we use to do that is cospans. 
So I think if you were at, since everyone was at Priya's talk this morning, I think that's a, a good thing to, to think about. If in, in Priya's talk, she had the, the category of resistors, which were certain kinds of, uh, of resistor networks, which were certain kinds of pictures, right? And then, the, how do those pictures glue together? Well, the way, the way she did it was by, you know, the, the hypergraph category, but there is a way to see that as using pushouts from co-spans. This is the sort of decorated co-span point of view. And then, she does is she takes semantics of these. And those semantics live in some kinds of relationships between variables, namely the, conduct the, the, the currents that can appear at the junctions of those wires. And so that's our second uh, idea of what a system is here, as a relationship amongst variable quantities. Again, this is a theory of theories of systems, a relationship among variable quantities. For example, the various sorts of theories of systems we could have here is like Hamiltonian, okay? You have a bunch of quantities, there's a Hamiltonian, which expresses a relationship between them, namely their mm, roughly energy. And there's also the Lagrangian point of view, where you have uh, you know, different kinds of quantities and you have another kind of uh, number that you associate to them. And then, yeah, okay. So the way you compose these kinds of systems together is uh, you set some of their exogenous variables to be equal. Or sometimes you have a simple function. For example, you set the sum of them to be zero or something like that. That's also a very common thing. Um, and these use spans and they compose via pullback. So that's the categorical technology for this. And the third one, which is the one we're going to focus on today, is what I like to call the parameter setting doctrine. And these are dynamical systems in a, in a more sort of traditional sense of what, when, when you say the word dynamical system to a, uh, a mathematician, which is that you have a notion of how things can be, which we call states, and then you have a notion of how things can change given how they are, which we call dynamics. And uh, we also have exposed variables of states. And the dynamics can depend on parameters. And we can set those parameters according to the exposed variables of other systems. I'm going to go into this in more detail, but that's the basic idea. So um, a system of ODEs works like this, by the way, where you have some parameters. You have some, ODE, you have some, some variables in your ODEs. You have some functions of the parameters. The, different, the derivatives are set as functions of some parameters. Maybe I can uh, ask some examples later on. Um, and, uh, and then. You, you can put them together by saying that like, oh, the parameter here, right? That's gonna be equal to the variable over there. And now we've, we've taken our two systems of ODEs and we put them together, we get one big system where we now, some of the things that were parameters have now been set to be variables or constants or other things like that. Okay. So these compose using lenses and lens composition. And that's sort of the point of view that I'm taking here at this talk. And uh, so I want to uh, describe this categorical tool, lenses and lens composition, in, in the same sort of setting here. One kind of cool thing, and we'll come to this at the very end if we have time, is that actually all three of these things are just spans and pullback. So co-spans and push-out are spans and pullback in the opposite category. And in fact, lenses are in fact spans of a special sort, and they do in fact compose by pullback. So uh, these kinds of, the functor lenses that we're talking about. So in fact, almost all lenses can be thought of in that way, which is kind of wild. So it turns out that there's actually only one categorical tool we're gonna use, which is pullback. Um, Okay, so uh, my main example here will be uh, a Mohr machine, and a Mohr machine is a, uh, a generalization of a deterministic finite automaton. Well, they're not necessarily finite. Um, they are deterministic and they are automatons, which are to say that they are uh, uh, dynamical systems, is another way to say it. So. Uh, Usually they're written in a, you draw a picture. So I'm gonna draw a little picture. Okay, so if you've seen a picture like this before, this is a picture you could give of an automaton or transition system. Um, the way you read this is you, let's say, start somewhere, and then you read in a letter, and the letter is either A or B. And if you read an A, you follow the A path, and you go here. 
And if the letter was B, you follow the B path and you go here. And then you read in another letter and then you keep going. And so this is sort of a picture you might have seen before of a finite state machine or a state machine. I could have said also these are sometimes called state machines, so on. There's another thing that usually you have some kind of output that they do. So I'll put here. This one can either be an X or a check. That's the usual way we do it. And we say that if the state, we think about it, so now what does it do? It reads in the A. Well, actually, the way this actually works is, first, it, you take your state, it spits out an output, which in this case would be an X. And then it reads in a thing, and then it goes. So let's say I read an A. And then it spits out an X. And then I read in another letter. Let's say I read in an A again. I would go here. And then I would spit out a check mark. And if I didn't have any letters to read, I would say that I'm in an accept state, and I'm done. This is sort of the statement, the, the, the uh, deterministic finite automaton picture of these things. These are, general, these are generalized into more machines. And more machines can do a little bit more, um, which, <laughs> unintended pun. Um, so <laughs> for this one, if I name the states, which I will, I can tell you what it looks like in that four, five. So in this one, we have a more machine here. The S here in that picture is one, two, three, four and five, and our, uh, uh, here we only have one input alphabet, which is I, and that's A, B. We only have one output alphabet, which is O, and that's X, check. And so what we have here is a, a, a picture, but what that picture describes is really these two functions, which is U, which takes in an S and an I, and gives me an S, and uh, E, which takes an S and gives me an O. So what are these functions? U takes in my state and my input, and if you look here, you can see that if you're, I'm in any state and I read any input, there is a unique state I can go to, which is at the other end of that arrow. And that's the function that defines U. And E is this little one that spits out our output. So the names here stand for update and expose, or uh, uh, um, exhibit this variable. Um, yeah, maybe I should do that. There's actually a lot of chat. They're asking if there is a way to switch between slides and whiteboard, but I don't think so because they are from different feeds, right? The slides are on your computer, Yeah. the whiteboard is on the camera, so I think it's the end user that has to decide what to pin. Okay. So I don't know if everyone could hear that, but you can pin yourself, you can pin, you can choose which to pin, and if you pin the whiteboard, it should come up as whiteboard. I'll try to say if I'm switching. Uh, so I'm gonna go back to the slide now and point at it. Um, <laughs> all right, so, right. So this is like a picture you might see, if you, if you took a, like a theory of computing class, you'd see pictures like this. Um, this is a special case where you have like these, like the very simple output alphabet, but in general, a Moore machine can take in multiple inputs at the same time from different sets and can give out multiple outputs at the same time. And we box it all up into a little box like up top. So that box up top has two input symbols and three different output symbols living in those various sets. Okay? And then its dynamics is given by two functions, a U and an E. And the U takes in a state and a bunch of input symbols and gives you the next state we'll, we'll transition into. And the E just outputs the current output that you have for this given state. Okay. Um, are there any questions with this kind of concept? I think at this point, I'd like to do so. Yeah, I think at this point, you know, I, I might I might give you a little uh, uh, task of like coming up with a fun one of these, and then uh, uh, that will be our first exercise. I didn't have that written up, but you have a question. This, this Um, usually, the, uh, my, my understanding is a finite automaton is either just the U or it's the U in the accept state. Uh, it, it, it's where t O is taken to be a two, a two element set. Um, so a more machine is usually presented where it only has one I and one O, so they are Cartesian product together. Um, but uh, it's useful to, keep, to separate them out like this because it will help us 
um, when sometimes part of the output we want to send to one machine and part of the output we'll want to send to another. If I skip ahead, you can see we'll wire these machines together into little circuits. But I'm going to go back. So I think uh, just to get in the habit of exercise doing, maybe I can have, uh, have you come up with um, a machine like this. Uh, that, that, that does something. It's a very general specification, but uh, you know, one thing is like a good example is a clock that reads nothing and it just ticks forward and then it outputs the current hour. You know, how would you describe that in this formalism? Um, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> That's, huh? If the only thing you can do with the clock is going forward. And you need a clock to make the clock tick. Yes, uh, that's a good point. So the thing about these uh, these things is they're sort of on a global clock. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you, you you start to get really annoyed when you actually want to do form, formalizing with this. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These are um, they are all on a global clock, and it makes a lot of things really annoying. Yeah. yeah. But but um, and this is yeah. The general like lens-based systems have this issue in general. Um, they all synchron update synchronously, yeah. And uh, and uh, the, the clock is determined effectively by the fact that you have to apply U every time you update, and so it, there's like discreteness in it. Um, uh, you can get continuous time systems with the same formalism. I should note. I'm not going to cover that too much, um, but like, but you have to represent them in a sort of uh, uh, as as differential equations or something, so that that's that's not as varying in time. Something that is fixed in time that you then can compute the variable in time, variation in time. Yeah. Okay, so this is an exercise break. Yes. Can we have people ask asking? David, keep asking questions to David, but also like maybe get into the and then everyone talk. Yes, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I think like if you just come up with a few little examples of this, just to, to you know, check yourself amongst your table, because we're already split up into tables, class. <laughs> this room is technically a classroom. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Um. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's cool. I have a I have this so that people share. Yeah, the success of the process. Yeah, I think so. This will have harder. Okay. Um, so I think uh, uh, we're gonna we're gonna share a few examples, and then we'll we'll keep going. So. Uh,
Uh, okay, I have an example that is, where's the range here? Possibly bad, but maybe uh, discussable, which is uh, the set of states. I'm looking at a patch of ground in the forest and the state is some reasonably complete description of like the state of moisture and the amount of light that is exposed to and how dry it is in temperature, kind of environmental conditions. Uh, output is probably just a state. I kept changing what that is. And input is something like bringing in some seeds or spores to that patch of ground and the state can transition by getting a little sprout or some new fungi if there's some rotting wood there, something kind of like that. So we were going back and forth a little bit about how terrible an example that is because it's not very closed. Things sort of tend to pop into a patch of ground and so update themselves. That's, that's great. I think one thing that leads me to, to point out one special thing about this is even though I use the words input and output, it's probably better to think of the inputs as parameters. So the input you would have is not the sprout, like the resource, the thing that gets consumed, but rather the fact that there is a sprout, right? Zero or one. One, there is a sprout. Uh, or one, there is a seed. And then, then the dynamics is that if it's one, it will sprout, right? So rather than, than thinking of these as little machines that take in input and reconfigure it and then spit out output, they, they really have parameters and then they expose some part of their state. As you, as you mentioned, it's very common for them to expose their whole state. In fact, in most of the things that aren't done by category theorists, you won't even see this second function in there. Um, because it's taken as implicit that any part of the state is accessible. But it's kind of useful to have this where we can just solo it out. Yeah. Anyone else? If we're just that they're not consuming resources and increasing resources. But they're does it make sense to think of parameters and a purple of informational resources? But yeah, yeah. That's uh, yeah, that's maybe a little better. It's the signal. Yeah. As, we, as we'll see that they're duplicable. So in that sense, they're like informational. Um, so um, yeah, anyone else? Any uh, examples of little, uh, this isn't, anyone wrote down the definition of a clock in this? Yeah. <laughs> um, so for the clock, I think you can write just uh, you basically have a finite state machine with like 12 states and then 60 states um, is one way of doing it. OK. Uh, so your, your S was going to be, uh, you know, uh, I guess 1 through 12. And then you also wanted the seconds or the minutes? That's what I was thinking, yeah. 60. So I'm going to take a pair. It's going to be one of these two. OK. And then. Uh, let me just say, I don't know, what do you want the output here, I guess? Uh, the state is what I would say. OK, we'll just have to put the whole state. And then uh, the i, so what is the, what is the parameter of this system? So maybe a trick question. Uh, point, like a single pointed set, correct? Yeah. It's a single thing which you can think of as saying, like, just go, just keep going, right? OK, and then the uh, update here, well, it's actually maybe a little complicated, but <laughs> but the update here, it takes in our, our, our state here, which is the hour and the minute, and it takes in star, and it's going to be <laughs> uh, increment the time. Yeah. Whatever modular arithmetic. <laughs> Yeah, something like that. Uh, Is that right? Oh, then the hour, like. Yeah, the hour too. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Does this work? I don't know. All right. <laughs> Great. Um, OK, so the, the nice thing about these more machines and writing it this way is that we can compose them. And this is how, where the lenses are really going to shine here. So suppose we have these two more machines. I wrote up one up here. Um, you can throw it back to me if you'd like. Um, this is a one. Oh, yeah, can I? <laughs> yeah. Whee! All right. <laughs> um, so for this is like a digital clock. Mm -hmm. Is it because the hour hand moves in like full increments? Mm -hmm. But in a real, like a watch, the hour hand moves continuously. Is that 
Something right. In that play. case, you would maybe just want to have it. Maybe you were saying this where you just want to have it, whatever, mod 12 times 60. <laughs> and then you want to output only the maybe discrete hour, and you would want to reduce that number further, mod 12 or something. Wait, there's more than one way to frame it. There's more than one way to frame it. Yeah. And there's, there's yeah. Yes. What? Ready? <laughs> okay, so I feel like I should pre preface this by saying that I haven't done anything like this since undergrad. Uh, wouldn't there be a way to do the hours and the seconds separately? Like, so that you don't have 12 times 60 uh, nodes do like do one circle for the hours and then one circle for the minutes and like combining them, them in some way? Uh, yeah, 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 you could do that as well. Yeah, sorry. If that's, uh, uh, you could, uh, yeah, yeah. There could be different ways to implement this, huh? Can we wire together more machines? We can uh, wire together more machines to get an, uh, a, a uh, thing like that, yeah, yeah. Um, although plugging in, gluing the graphs together isn't the same as wiring them in, I should note. Um, so, but yeah. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, so there are many ways to solve this kind of thing. There are many different kinds of ways that you could represent these systems. It, it's a very, very broad sort of framework. But yeah, there's absolutely, you could just like walk into the ring of hours and then only be able to walk out afterwards. Um, okay, so suppose we had two more machines here. One takes in an A and gives out a B, one takes in a B and a C and gives out an A. And we can wire them up like this in this kind of sort of circuit here. Oh, God. There's like, <laughs> oh, no. Can I like, oh, yeah? Maybe it's screen. How can I make it full screen? View? Ooh, immersive. No, not immersive. Oh, here? Does anyone know how to do this? Alt what? <laughs> oh, well, it did work. <laughs> um, thank you. <laughs> OK. So, um, so here we have this combined system, and it sort of does the intuitive thing. Let's say, which is that, what does a combined system to do? Well, it has, the states are both of the states of the, of, the, of the inner systems. And then the output from one, as you can see here, gets plugged into the input of the other, or we set that parameter to be equal to the exposed variables, another way to say it. And the output of the second one, what we do here is we copy it. We copy it, and that's sort of, this is it's informational because we can copy them freely. We copy it, and one of them will pass all the way out, all the way to the outside, and the other one will feed back into the input of the first system. And so uh, I hope you could sort of see that there's an intuitive way that you wire together these more machines, right? Um, and uh, uh, which is that you feed the outputs of some to the inputs of others, right? Maybe the inputs of themselves. There's nothing preventing me from, for example, having just a loop on the same system. Right? And I can copy those, those symbols and send one to one place and one to another place and so on. And the combined system has this update, which you can see I've, I've sort of computed by looking at this picture. So the, what is the exposed, so my states are pairs of states of the first system and the second system. And what is my exposed variable? Well, as you can look up in here, the, with the first system I expose a variable of its state and the second system I expose a variable of the state but the, the variable that I expose from the first system is not passed to the outside. It's somehow fully internal. That wire doesn't go outside. So I'm going to forget about it. Whereas the wire from the second state I do pass outside. And so what, was, what is carried on that wire, it's supposed to be the E2, the exposed variable of the state of the second system. And that's what I read up here, E2S2. So what is the update of this combined system? Well. We update a pair of states, and we have one input, which is that C, which comes in on this wire over here, right? And so that C is getting plugged into the second one over here, 
And that is, that is showing up in, in this formula here. But we need to update both states. So let's see how we can update both states. So the first state we have to update, well, we have to look at where its input comes from. Its input comes from the output of the second system. So to, we update the first system with the output of the second system. And in the second system, we have also, we also need to figure out where that first input is coming from. The second one's coming from the outside, C. But the first one comes from the first system. So we expose the variable from the first system, we plug it in and we update. And this is a combined update system. And so I, I hope it's clear that you, whenever you have a picture like this, you could read out this formula, right? Um, but I don't wanna have to do this by hand. So we're gonna first bring in lenses, lenses to do this. So, um, yep. Uh, it's it's uh, uh, with a combined system. It's not necessarily the case that you could always split a combined system into component subsystems. Yeah, yeah. Um, but this is this is like multiplication, which is always easier than the, the, the problem of factoring, right? Um, yeah. Uh, no, as it turns out that they, uh, uh, that's why they, they, they sort of, ex the, the, you can think of this, the variable is always exposed. And so it is at this moment in the state it's currently in exposed. You don't have to run, so in other words, maybe I could say this a different way, the, 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 you run them simultaneously. The, the output of the system you use is the output from the state it's currently in, not the state it will transition to. So that means there's an absolute there is an absolute time, and that's what I was saying in, in response to Fabrizio. So, yeah, so. So what, what happens if you uh, take a single, a single more machine that just implements the Boolean negation and wiring itself? Um, what's its input? It's, a it's like controlled knot or something. It's like it, sure. to, to wire it to itself, it needs to have an input wire. So that's what I'm asking. What? So, so maybe it's maybe it's XOR, and you have one input that's that's coming in on, and then you have the second the, the output. Right. So let's um let's let's work that out. Maybe I can have this as a uh, little exercise here. But I think we have this XOR box. So what is this thing? This is a bit. This is a bit, and this is a bit, and we have to have two things, right? So what is the state of this thing? I mean, these aren't functions. These are state machines. So the state of this, like, is it, it, the minimal thing we could have the state be is the, the bit that's going to be output, right? Um, so I'll make the state be bit. Then the I's and O's you can read off the picture, right? So what is U? U is gonna be taking bit cross bit times bit, which is the input, and it's gonna give me bit. And what does it do? So U, of, I'm just going to put it blank, B1, B2 is equal to XOR, B1, B2. In other words, we're just going to overwrite the state with the input. Maybe this is not what you intended. If you, we could, we could do it a different way, but it's all going to depend on how you, these are state machines, they're not functions, right? So, um, uh, and the exposed thing I'm just going to have, the expose my bit will just be my bit. So I'm just going to expose the state. Um, and then if we wired it up like this, right? Now what is that? Well, this is now, it has the same states, right? But now the input is not bit times bit. It's um, just bit, right? And I should say that the ex export here is nothing, as in we put, we'll put a star. We put our dummy variable here. Um, yeah, we could copy off the output. So, could copy off the output. Um, so now, what is this thing? Well, we have to see what it would do. It, the old one did this. It, it took in B1 and B2 and give a, it took in the state 
chucked it, and did b1 and b2. But now we've set b1 to be equal to the thing that we used to expose, and which we do still expose because we've copied it out, which is the current state. So now I actually have to put my b here. And now I don't take in two things. I only take in another thing, which I'm going to still call b2. And now, what do I do? Well, I do my, my, my operation from before, but I've set the first input to be the output. So this becomes b in here. And this is uh, maybe a good thing if uh, we'll, we'll, when we do lens composition, you can check that this still, that this actually gets out when you, when you compose you lenses in this way. Why is the same b? Because if you imagine here, right, this box in here, its update was, you know, this took, the update in here took, uh, took B1, took, two, took, uh, took B, B1 and B2 and gave us XOR B1, B2. But you see, it did depend on B, it just, we didn't use it. We didn't use the current state. But now, when I loop it around, I set my first input, which is b1, to be equal to my exposed thing, which was my b. So I have to substitute it in, in the formula. Is the XOR either or? Yes, either or, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, in terms of modeling, it like, doesn't seem possible to model the situation where it doesn't happen. You could have it. Uh, you could have a system that just has a single state and stays in it, for example. Um, or you could have a system that stays in a. That's a good question. Um, not with simple lenses, but with dependent lenses, which I may cover at the end if we get there. Um, you could do that, in fact. I'm just saying, like, to make it concrete, like, in quantum mechanics, the difference between the observer and the observed, well, one way to model that I think would be like, if you look at the binomial theorem, you have a choice, x or y, right? When you model simplexes, that becomes like, we're going to cube them or not chosen. You know, something happened or not happened. Whereas if you have like a cube, it would be, you turn left or you turn right, it's a semantic one. You, you the could. Point, you, the point, and the point being that the, in the case of an observer, an observer parts up to the face and something cannot happen. That means that somebody's controlling the, the space or time of the face. You, 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 could have a, you could have a system that can, deter, can go into like a state that says this is not going to happen and represent that as a special extra state. Or, or ASCII, like, will I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on, sorry. Um, OK, so a simple lens is uh, going to be a pair of functions like this. So the one thing I want to note about this here, so uh, I, I call it the forward direction on the bottom and the backward direction on the top. And the, uh, uh, the forward direction, so we have, uh, we have here four different sets. The domain is a pair of sets and the codomain is a pair of sets. And I've written them as A plus and A minus. They're, they don't have to be related to each other, by the way. But I'm going to call them A plus and A minus so that they're, we know that A is the domain and then we just split it up in these two ways. And the forward direction goes from A plus to B plus and the backward direction goes from B minus to A minus. But it also takes in an extra argument. And that extra argument comes from A plus. So in some, in some sense, the, the way that the forward, the, for, the downflowing information can affect the way the information flows back. And this is our bidirectional uh, lens. And so a Moore machine, as you can see, is a lens of this form, where we have our state of space is S and S are the same set here. And then, the, then on this side, we have the interface for the Moore machine, where on the bottom, the downflow is the outputs and the uh, the top is the is the inputs here and if you substitute it in what you'll find is that it's the same definition as here it's these pair of maps going in opposite directions okay but um oh so I have a this is my first exercise thing which maybe I should have stuck to um, here and I, I think I'll uh, uh, let everyone do this, but uh, maybe if you could bring this up separately, it's usually my definitions are on the slides and then my exercises are separate. So um, I'm gonna go back to the slide. But if you could bring up the, uh, the, uh, the sheet yourself, 
this is going to be our first real exercise here. Figure out what lenses mean in these variety of settings here, where one is a one element set. So I'm going to go back to the slide so that you can see the definition of lens written up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the the questions are gonna are, are sometimes long, so I'd prefer if you could just look it up on the website. Because like uh, this one is not so long, but they 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 get they have end up with long statements. I, I can bring it up here, but the definition of lens is not written on that document, whereas the definition of lens is written on the slide. But if I go back up, the first question is, uh, what data do we need to define lenses of the following forms? And we'll do this and then we'll take a coffee break. Absolutely, it absolutely is. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, the, so uh, I'll get to this, but we can do this in any Cartesian category because the only structure we use is the Cartesian product. Yeah. Um, I haven't described lens composition, but it uses the Cartesianness of the product, so it's not a monoidal thing. It's really a Cartesian thing, which is these in the um, the copies in those diagrams. That like copy is like Cartesian, um, but you could do it in appreciates of anything. Um, super useful to do it in manifolds. Um, you know, most dynamical systems theorists study this in the category of measurable spaces. Uh, you can do things on graphs, which can be useful. You 
you can um, there's also a dependent version of these so you could have a graph you could have a, the update has to go along a path in the graph so you have a state graph and then the update of your system goes along a path in that state graph to another thing so there's all sorts of things like that both systems you have your current state and you can yeah so you can yeah, so there's um, I, I, uh, given the pace we're going at, I'm definitely not going to get to this, but there's a lot of different variants on lenses, and you can do, you know, you can do those ones. Yeah. So including the path that I get, not re reconstructing stuff. Well, I don't want to say you can't do something, but like that, that's not what I was thinking of. But yeah, yeah. y'all have you all saw, saw this? Do you want? Have you done one? Because I'll I'm, I came here with this to have a, one of them be presented, but then I'll wander around again. Yeah. Sweet. Okay, I'm gonna wander. I don't know what time it is. Yeah. 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 So these are these are correct. These are the two things, right? And so when I'm um, in here, right, like I'm sort of asking, what if what if a a a b minus and a minus were one element sets, right? If they just had one element, then what's like what what if they were one element, right? So well, if a minus was a one element set, right, then this function would have to return that one. This, always return. Yeah. So the only data is this. Oh, uh, I'm going to do one of these just so y'all can see what I mean by this, just in case, but uh, When I say, like, what is the data involved in this, if I write out the definition, which I put at the top up there, of what, like, what a lens is, it's a pair of functions like this. Right? But in this case, B minus and A minus are this one element set. So I'm going to replace them in here. And now, if I look at this, I note that the, the backwards direction is returning an element of a one element set, right? The codomain is a one element set. So there's no choice, like, like one is a set that contains a single dummy element. So this function always has to return that single dummy element. It has to, right, for every argument in it. There's no other choice. So the data here is basically just the data of a function a plus to b plus, because f minus must be of a certain form. And that's what I mean by solving this question. In all of these cases, there's less data that suffices to determine the entire structure of the lens. I didn't want to stop everyone in their tracks, but I did want to like maybe narrow down what I mean by this from. Uh, 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 I, I'm not sure what I mean. I use circ for the for the composition. I, I just mean in the sense that I have two lenses. Yes, yes, and uh, in fact, the next slide is lens composition. So we'll. Yeah, it's good. Uh, we are sorry. This is why I wanted everyone to have like 
we are like we are on this slide, and this slide has the one at top. So we're on exercise one. Um, so uh, yeah. So don't worry about proving that lens composition is associative. I haven't introduced it. We also can take a co copy break. Um, you know, I think if uh, I don't know how is everyone doing on these on these four. Okay. We're good. Okay. okay. So yeah, I'll, I can. Oh no, what have I done? Um, so yeah. Okay. So in the first one, it's a function a plus the b plus. In the second one, in b, who wants to take a an answer? I can throw the box. Wanna? Y'all want to do it since the box is already here? All right, I'm going to throw it in. Then. You want to do it? All right. No? Yeah. Ah. Function from B minus to A minus. Function from B minus to A minus, right? So if I take this, right, and instead I have this, B minus A minus, and then I put this to be one, one, one. Then this is a dummy variable, so it can't change on that. So it's only a function b minus to a minus. That's correct. So um, yeah, I, I'll let you pass it to someone else. Um, OK, so what about c? Someone raised their hand. An element of b plus. Um, an element of b plus, right. So again, if this is B plus, right, and then here it was A plus was this, A minus is also one. Then you can see again, this is a dummy variable, it just lands there. So this is a function from one to B plus, it has to send that dummy variable to a single element, so that's an element, that's right. We'll do the last one. It's fun. Um, so you kind of want to, so we kill everything on the bottom with the F plus, right? So A plus goes to one, we're going to kill all of that. And we sort of want to say that we're creating a state from the top of one going to A minus. Um, but in fact, it's a dependent state because the thing that we put from A plus uh, is important. And so it ends up being a function from A plus to A minus. That's right. So here, the B becomes a one and here it becomes a one and again this is mapping into one so it has to send it to the single element of one so there's no real data going on in the pass forward and now on the top we have the dummy variable in the b place so it ends up just being a function from a plus to a minus and this is kind of cool one thing i will i will note is that if we have a system like this ss uh, I O, right? Then let's say I wanted to put a start state on this system, right? A start state is just the state of the system that I agree to start at. If you learned about automatas in some class, they usually come with a start state. Well, that would be a lens like this in the back. And let's say I wanted to close off this system. I wanted to take out the output and feed it back into the input right away. Right, without passing it through a different other system. Well, that would be a lens like this. I'm putting it on the other side. Now, uh, now if you, <laughs> we will see if you compose lenses, you would eventually get a lens one, one to one, one. That wouldn't be interesting. But the point is that the extra data you can do with systems appears as lenses of signatures that could be composable with them. We'll see that they are, in fact, the fact that they are written with these morphisms is not uh, an accident. Okay, great. So let's take a little coffee break and then we'll, what have I done? Um, I guess, uh, what do we do? 15 minutes or 30 minutes? 15 minutes? Let's meet back at four. Should I take this off? Just take it off. It's not over yet. <laughs> And it just works. And you can throw it at people. <laughs> <laughs> 
Because you can start hurling things at people's heads without worrying about actually half damaging them. I just want to make sure I was understanding. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Breathes in something into it in the state that you put in the house are all the same, and it just doesn't work. Yeah. Um, one or five points together. You do take five points. I do take that to the box that I normally work with. It does. Where the state is just the output, and then you just overwrite it with this. And then you put the identity function in here, and that's just a And in fact, the, the fact that you have this little clock means that when you want to actually design systems, because you, you, you end up having to put these delays in there. So, I was I was confused because I was thinking that uh, that it was sort of like physical circuit where you just change the inputs and then wait for everything to filter out and then read things at the end. Yeah, no, which would cause problems if you have to cycles. Right, right, but that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, no, everything has a has a You know, the second thing. Yeah, and then you fell in love with MIC? Yeah, uh, so, uh, so, uh, most of So, right, where you, I guess you define the index category as this bypassing category, which unfortunately gives you a deterministic readout. So, you were yes. It's and, kind of important. Yes. Okay. And you said you said it's because uh, you need this diagonal. Yeah. Uh, okay. You so um, oh, I guess yeah, it's all it's all about categories. Right? Like work every object. Like, oh, yeah. 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 So you can also do it by having stuff. But the problem that has to be on the Really? But okay. okay. so you could you can do it in the Markov category by saying that they find more disciplinary. Uh, that's right. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, so, so oh, I think that yeah. within yeah. departments, lots of it happens. Yeah. Just try to do people do a lot. I think people do a lot. Yeah. 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 Just in my shop, like in our group and the people, and then we try to improve the lenses or something. Well, someone else sees exactly what they're doing. Yeah. 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 Y
There's a lot of things to do. Yeah. 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 Old Sorry. You know, I'm not the touch of this game. I'm stuck. Everybody gasped when I said I'm not going to change my heart. The message. What kind of fun was it? Yeah. What do you think? Oh, well, you know, it's not so after that.
David, I think you're on mute. Yeah, sorry. And I, okay. I, when did that happen? Um, yeah. Could you uh, stop the recording and start it over again? Sure. <laughs> okay. Um, so a wiring diagram is also a lens. So this, in this case, it's really important that we have different things on the on the bottom and top. So in here, this wiring diagram, which we saw on the previous page, can be described as this lens. And let me go through it. So in this wiring diagram, what you can see is there are inner boxes and there are is an outer box. And the outer box is going to appear on the right in the codomain of the lens, and the inner boxes are going to appear on the left in the domain of the lens. And so then the top and bottom are going to be differentiated into the input and output ports on these boxes. So on the outer box, we take in an element of C on the C wire, and we give out an element of A on the A wire. And that's why we have out in the bottom and in on the top like that. Okay? And over here, we're going to take in in, when we look in there, we look at it all the ways we go in in here. So there are two boxes, and each one of them has, a, uh, uh, well, the first one has one input, and the second one has two inputs. So in total, we have three things, and that's A, B, and C. So at the top there are the inputs, all the different inputs multiplied together for the inner boxes. And then the two inside ones, we also have two outputs here. One is a B and one is an A. We're ignoring the fact that we're copying. We're just looking at like local to the boxes, what comes in and what goes out. So out of the second box, we have an A. And out of the first box, we have a B. So our outputs for the inner boxes are B and an A. So B times A. And then what is the actual uh, function here? These two functions sort of tell us actually how these things are wired together. So let me look at the, at the bottom, right? I take the outputs for the inner boxes and I pick uh, which ones of them I'm going to actually send out to the outer box. So here you can see that I look at my two outputs for the inner boxes. So I have a B maybe coming out on this wire and I have an A maybe coming out on that wire. And which one of those, like what of those do I put out to the full outer box? It's the A. So I set this, sec this one, this function to yield the A. It just ignores the B. Okay? And on the top, here, right, we have our input one. And what is it going to do? Well, here it's going to take in an input for here the inner boxes. Sorry, it's going to take in an output for the inner boxes and an input from the outer box, which is how this works. So here's an input from the outer box. And then we're also perhaps going to take in outputs from the inner boxes. So it's B and an A. And then we have to fill in all the inputs to the inner boxes using that data. And as you can see here, our A right here, it comes from the output A here. And our B comes from the output B there. And that says that this A gets connected all the way to that one, and this B gets connected to that one. And then finally, the C we actually do bring all the way from outside. So this lens here has all the data of this wiring diagram. And in fact, we can compose lenses together and use that composition of lenses to wire together systems according to the wiring diagrams. Because the thing I want you to note is if I take the two systems here, then their combined outputs would have this, would be of this shape here. And so we could just compose them. Is there a question? Yeah. That's a great question. It's not in this. Um, I will come to the monoidal structure, and then we'll write this in a, the same signature in a slightly different way, and it will be more clear um, which one comes from which. But you, you, the, that's a, it's a good point. The way I wrote it here, it's not clear which inner box comes from which. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, the, if I wanted to. That's great. That's a great question. There are no passing wires. So this is not a, a, these kinds of wiring diagrams are very particular. And I'll, I'll give a definition shortly. But um, no passing wires. 
And uh, uh, there's, there's in fact two sort of rules that determine what they, how to, how to draw them, um, which I will come to. Um, yeah. It's a hard like forward backwards here. Yeah. It's more about the like, input and output, like inner and outer. Yes. It's not left to right. It's not left to right. That's a great, that's a great point. Thank you. So yeah, the, 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 the forward direction goes like forward to you and the backward direction goes into the page. Right? So yeah, so um, uh, 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 nesting inside. Um, and we'll in fact see that composition of lenses when applied to wiring diagrams corresponds to nesting the wiring diagrams. Um, okay. So, uh, oh, here's an example of, uh, this is a appendix exercise A. I think I'm going to skip it, but this is an example of a view update lens. So this is the sort of like traditional thing that a lens is supposed to do. Um, here you can see our two functions. This is just another good example of a lens, right? Here, let's say we have, uh, you know, three, uh, uh, we have a, a, a point in 3D space. So it has an X coordinate, a Y coordinate, a Z coordinate. And I can make this view update problem. I want to view the X coordinate and I want to update the X coordinate. Right? So I can take these two functions called get x and set x. And get x takes x, y, and z and yields x. So I get x. And set x takes x, y, and z and a new x uh, uh, coordinate called x prime. And I set x to be x prime. There. And this is very special. It's very lawful. It satisfies these three uh, lens laws. And in fact, the exercise A says that if you have a lens that satisfies those three laws, you are actually of this form. You're just getting and setting a product projection. Okay. But I'm going to right away. All right. Lens composition. So this is like the most important thing about lenses is that we can compose them. They, in fact, form a category. Um, this is the formula for composition. Um, so if we have a lens from A to B and a lens from B to C, we get a composite lens for which goes from A to C. So on the bottom, it just composes forward. So here on the bottom, uh, here's string diagram notation. On the bottom, we just plug into the first one, then plug into the second one and go on. So that's the formula up there. Um, the forward directions compose directly. The backward directions compose in a little more interesting way. So what you can see here is that, first of all, the nesting is opposite because the backwards direction go in the opposite direction, right? So we have, here we have uh, G plus of F plus of little a plus. The backwards direction, we take an A plus and a C minus because our composite lens is going from A's to C's, right? So the, 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 the signature of that would take an A plus and a C minus and give us an A minus. So we get that A minus using F minus, right? And F minus takes in an A plus and a B minus and gives us an A minus. So we take in the F, the, we have F minus and we take in our A plus over there and now we just need a, a B minus. And we can get that B minus from our G minus, which is at the top, right? The G minus takes a G plus and a C minus and gives us a B minus, right? But the problem is we don't actually have a B plus originally, right? We started with an A plus. So how do we get the B plus? Well, we can use the first pass forward to go forward and take the A plus into F plus A plus, which is a B plus. And then we can plug that into the G minus to bring back the C into B minus. And that's our composite there. So in the string diagrams, I will say that this string diagram is written left to right. Um, just to say, this is like an actual, honest to God, string diagram. And it describes the flow of information. We take our A plus and our C minus up top. Then we want to bring the C minus back into the B minus, which is that uh, green wire. So we need to get a B plus to help us. And we use F plus to do that. But then we also need to copy along our A plus because we're going to use it again to bring back the thing we had in B minus even further. Yeah, question. I saw a question somewhere. Maybe not. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so you need to, uh, if, imagine we didn't have the A plus in it. We were just bringing it back. It's just composition in the opposite direction. 
but we do actually have these other variables around and we need to put them in and we effectively put them in in the only way it can make sense. If we, if we, yeah, if we remove the forward part A plus in, in both cases, it would look exactly just like we composed them, but in the opposite order, going back, yeah. Um, and so my exercise here, we're still going to do some exercises, is uh, prove that lens composition is unital and associative, right? You can use string diagrams, you can use, uh, uh, you can just like write out the formulas and check, right? Um, and by unit all, I mean like what is an identity lens? You have to come up with the notion of identity lens and then prove that the composition with the identity lens acts as the identity. So what, what we're doing here is proving that this composition is part of a category. So I'm gonna go back and put up the definition of lens composition. and uh, talk amongst yourselves. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I like this extra size A. Hmm? Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 Wish that Gatlab were already Yeah, I wouldn't like uh, if I could be yeah. would be good. Yeah. Um it's fine those interesting string diagrams or sound. Um the string diagram these are string diagrams for the Cartesian Minoto category. So it's it's yeah. Yeah, they're just two of them next to each other. Yeah. The direction on the arrow is just whether it's plus or minus. Plus or minus. Yeah, it doesn't mean anything though. It's just it's just like the the superscript to the a. Yeah. It's it's much better. <laughs> yeah. It'll it'll melt your brain way less. You know? Literally just line one up, line them up like this. Boop. Um, so the composition is you have to put a box around that whole thing. The, to compose it again, put a box around the whole thing. I'm trying to speak quietly, so I don't, but I'll just, you put a box around the whole thing like that, right? And then, um, as you can see, it now, the outer box, if you ignore, if you black box the insides, it's a box with two inputs, one output of the right form, right? And then you look at that formula and you write it again, but now one of those things is going to be one of these composites, right? So I might go on up and do this out. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so that is. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but like, will 
one for your geomorphism for you, but you, but you're just a second. Okay, so so let's be if we were doing F G H, right? Let's which parenthesization do we want to do? If we do F G, because that's the one that's already computed, F G and then H, right? Now the H would take the place of the G in this formula because right so but the f would be fg so we take that whole box and we put it where the f was in there but we'd relabel so it to be the g would be h and then then you know and then look at that and then you're going to try and rearrange it until it looks like the other one you could write both of them so it's going to like you know, the bottom line, the bottom line, they literally do just like, yeah. It's just the plus or minus. It, you, if you switch the order of the yeah the, the order if you switch the order of the top then the flow does go this way but i i wanted it to just be uh it's not exactly true no because <clears throat> you well that's not the composition of of three that's not the composition of that's not the composition of two or i mean you've kind of written them both together so it kind of is the composition of two in that yeah yeah in this case you're, it's so it's not really doing this but when you write it like that it does become more clear but you still need to do something it's not i would say it's not obvious write a third one On the bottom, that's yeah. That one's that one's always. Yep. Right. But now, like you, you, you do need one thing, which is you need to, to move it past the copy. I mean, you need to use the fact that the copy copies. It's non-trivial because when you try to generalize this, you realize you can't do it in a generic monodal category. You need the copy. Yeah. On the bottom. This is why it's nice not to draw it in that way, because you end up noticing that you only need it. I mean, I think it's just there are like so many laws that are there just so you can get it. Thank you. 
might end up in a different class of things to where we began, but we end up somewhere else. That's the idea. Is that what's going on? That's the way of thinking about it. Yeah. It's almost like the more machines that we did at first, but the essence. Yeah, the essence. The essence we just separate. don't think. Yeah. Okay, good. So we have those situ We have two of them now. Yeah. Like, get a whole bunch of information out of I think what we can get, let's say that it just. So obviously, the resolution of the bottom makes total sound that's easily done. That's a resolution in a different. Yeah, well, I think on the top is the problem, right? Because on the top, what we need to do when we're composing, we need to be given a situation where we. Where we um, and we're given C minuses. This is half so you know, the only other part of the point is you can hear your two the weather, or if your friend recently told you that you um, some other thing you saw have seen a TikTok that tells you that sunglasses are cool. Uh, and then your outputs are uh, like uh, uh, multiple outputs. So your outputs could just be things that you've been doing more true, I guess. You can have multiple outputs which are like uh, t shirts, and you might just never hear a copy. And then this deals is it takes a state and says what are the conditions and it might say something. So kind of is, is the thing that you add and then it moves to a new state which is nothing plus the additional thing. Yeah, then he has, it has to be the number of the category. Yeah, so I think I'm doing, so no, I think I'm just going to say. Yeah, so tops and sorts. Yeah, so there's no purpose. You can kind of do a new work from the bottom. Environmental conditions. But like, I mean, the, the, it, I mean, it could, I'm, all I'm trying to do, I guess, is trying to separate. In environmental things, we have possible things that you could add to your aquarium. is one of the environmental things. So if you put on a scar, you don't want to put on another scar. Oh, interesting. So you take that, you have a scar on an outlet. Plug that into the inputs of the next one. You already have a scarf on, so don't put it on the scarf. Things you okay? Okay, so maybe we don't want the things around your outfit. You just have the outfit that you currently have on, or like the new outfit itself. And that's going to go somewhere. No, okay, okay. But it does not make the current state better. That's, that's so the position, the final the state is being put in as input. 
Final, so the, the alpha is the same as the new state. The current state is where you're at, and then, and then we will create a new output. It's a bit of a shame because I want it to update, but I guess maybe that's fine. It will update based on the current state. Uh, okay. I probably prefer to have the alpha as well. Yeah. Um, if I want a second a second lens that I guess goes from the thing that on the top has the fire emoji and on the other thing, and on the bottom has the outfit that you're wearing. I don't really think I want a lens in that. So you could scoop out, scoop out, yeah, out or, or scoop out at the end. Or, yeah, I think the associativity, intuition of the associativity is it doesn't matter uh, which level of information. Which level of information you have? Okay, I think I'm gonna do. I'm gonna try to do this out. <laughs> I'm gonna do this with string diagram. Okay. So I'm gonna write the two sides out, and then I'll try and say what it is. So suppose we have these three of them. I'm going to write with the two. So the bottom part, if I have three of them, will look like this. Um, well, I'm going to have a lot of colors here. So it's going to be. If I write the bottom part out, if I write the bottom part out, then I'll, it'll be just the composite. Of uh, F plus, G plus, H plus. So the bottom is going to compose just by composing another one. Why is this associative? Well, it's associative because I can do those two first and then the other one, or I can do the first one and then the other two. So the bottom part of the input is going to be the top part of the input, and the top part is going to be the So that's the, uh, let's look at that. So, if I write the top one. So, so, so we seem to have an issue with the sound again. Uh, the mic is someplace. Mic's not working. Check, check. Yeah, okay. Um, great, thank you. Okay, um, great. So we are gonna, okay, so here, right, how would I do this? Well, my formula on the bottom is telling me how to compose two of these. Right? So if we forget about the labeling for a moment, we're going to have one of them, we're going to figure out which side we're going to do first. So let's do G and F first because that's composed and then we're going to compose that with H. So H minus. So in that formula on the bottom, the second thing we're doing is H minus and the first thing we're doing is G minus after F minus or G after F, right? So the H minus takes the role of the second thing, which in that place is a G minus. So I'm going to start with drawing this diagram out here. Um, 
I'm, I'm actually just going to do it in black just to save myself some time. So I'm going to do here. Here will be my H minus, and it will take in uh, my uh, D minus, right? And it's going to take in also um, my uh, uh, here. It's going to take in also my um, C plus, right? But then, yeah. Uh, yes. So I'm doing. I have these three things. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, I'm doing a, a H plus H minus after parentheses. G plus G minus after F plus F minus, like that. Yep. And then so this is H minus here. And then here I put this. And then I'm composing that with G after F. So in here, I put in this box. And this, this box here is G after F plus, which is in fact, so this is, uh, put it in here, right? G after F plus. This one is G after F. I'll just call them H, G, F for short. This is the plus part of that in here, over there. And then I compose that in with, uh, this gets duplicated over here. And this gets composed in with uh, uh, G after F minus, right? OK, but now I need to fill those in. So what is G after F plus? Well, it is G plus after F plus. So I'll write that in here. This is F plus. This is G plus. And then what is G after F minus? It's that whole thing down there. F plus, G minus, F minus. We have a copy over here. If this goes in over here, this goes in here. This comes out here. Right? OK, so that's the left-hand side. Uh, yes, thank you. That's correct. Right? So that's the left hand side. And we want to show that that's the same thing as now we have to do um, uh, H plus, or I'll just write H, H after G after F. Right? So now what we're going to do is it's going to be here, it's H after G minus. Here, um, and we take in here, and then we also take in here, we take in F plus into this, and then we also copy it over, and we go into F minus here. Right? That's the, oh no, I have uh, my charger back there, so I might get that in a second. Um, so uh, that's the second side. Now we need to uh, compute what this one is, right? It's H after G minus, so we have to go look into what that would be right here. It's H minus, right? And then it takes in, uh, in this one, it just takes this in, but then it is, this one is G plus, and it puts that in there, and then it also copies this over, and we go into here, into uh, G minus, and this one goes over. And then this goes out. OK. Oh, thank you. So all right. So um, now, OK, so these are my two sides. So I just computed out what they have to be. And we want to show that they're equal. Does this sort of make sense, what I just did here? All right. So how am I going to show that they're equal? I'm not going to do a, uh, I'm just going to like point and move my hands in, in you know, really suggestive ways. So we have, uh, first of all, the thing I want you to know is that we first copy, and then we do F plus G plus, and we put it into H plus. That, that left-hand left side of the diagram is the same already, right? Uh, did I do this right? There's a chance that I, uh, right. Well, sorry. Uh-oh. Do I have to share again? 
Is it being recorded? No, we have record. Oh, there it is. Okay, my screen. Sorry, I think my my iPad just uh, um, go here. Boop. All right. So um, right. Okay. So. All right, so if you look in here, let me get rid of these intermediate boxes for a second here because they're not doing anything. All right, so if you look in here, it's not exactly the same. There's something different going on, which is that here, right, in the left-hand side here, we'll make this a little clearer. This left-hand side here, we actually copy before we do the G+. Whereas on the right hand side, the F plus just goes right into the G plus and then over. And we have this other F plus all the, all the way over there. And we don't have that on this one, on the right hand side. Right? So what do we, what, what's different? Well, if we start on the right hand side, remember these are copies, we're in a Cartesian category. We can just move that F plus over that copy and duplicate it. Right? Which maybe I will actually do out. If we move it over here and duplicate it, we moved it over this copy, and then we get two copies of F plus like this. F plus, this one here, F plus, and the duplicate happens before. So like that, okay? Now it really looks like the other one, except that the F plus is in the wrong place. I mean, it is in the right place, but the copy doesn't happen before it. See, now we have this issue, which is that we have this thing, copied into F plus on the left here. And then we have this thing copied into F plus, right? If I draw those out, it's like this. Like that, and this one is like this. Like that. But that's a associativity of copy. Right? You see, I really just copy it three times. Um, by the way, this is not the only way to like, do composition of lenses. There's the optic way, which doesn't uh, have so many copies and doesn't store as much, inter well, it, it, uh, it, uh, yeah, it doesn't do as many copies. <laughs> uh, I'm not gonna talk about that. Um, anyway, so this is lens, that's the associativity. Um, did anyone come up with the, uh, the unit? Oh, I'll say something important about this before I go on, because we're not going to really have time to do monadic lenses and other kinds of lenses. Um, and I know that you're currently here and not in the Markov categories thing where you would learn sort of about Markov categories and about copy and delete and how that works. But the, the, crucially, we use the fact that the plus direction could copy past these copies. So we needed to have a copy to define this composition. But, you know, lots of... I, sorry. Lots of categories have copy, but not, not in all those categories can you always move past a copy. Um, so uh, uh, to move past a copy, if you're in a stochastic situation, you can always copy um, your, your data, but you can't necessarily move a function past a copy. You can only do that if that function is deterministic and not a stochastic function. And what we've seen here is that it's perfectly fine to do this in the stochastic setting, However, the forward direction must be deterministic if we want associativity. So, so the forward, so in, I'm not gonna cover this, but the, the forward, like in, in, in stochastic lenses, the backward direction can be stochastic, but the forward direction has to be deterministic. And if you apply those kinds of lenses to the systems, you get, instead of these more machines, you get Markov decision processes, those whose update is stochastic. So not going to cover that, but just wanted to point out this proof only used that the F pluses could move past the copy. Okay. So um, did anyone come up with the identity? Yeah. It's the second projection. That's right. So the identity here on the bottom, it would just be a wire, which is the identity. So Demos. And then here, right, we need to take, uh, this is forward, forward, right? Here's backwards. Here's backwards, and here is forwards, right? What do we do? How do we get from this side to that side? Well, this just goes over, and this one we'll just delete. This is the string diagram version. So yes, it is just a projection. Exactly. And that does, uh, if you plug it into the string diagrams, and again, you use this logic of 
the uh, it's the the sort of uh, co-commutative co-monoid algebras like structure on copy and delete. Here is delete. Um, then you can prove that this is in fact the identity for composition here as well. Um, or you can use the terms um, on the previous page like this stuff here. You could use that and just prove it right away. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So uh, now I want to talk about the monoidal product of lenses. So given two lenses, we can also tensor them. And the tensor um, is given by Cartesian product. So one thing I'll, uh, maybe I'll write here is that we could also write this thing as A plus A minus tensor C plus C minus. So the tensor on objects here is going to be Cartesian product on top and bottom. And the tensor on morphisms is sort of just pairing on top and bottom. And on the bottom, it's literally just pairing them together. But on the top, you just have to shuffle things around a little. You'll note that you actually end up using symmetry of, your, of our Cartesian monoidal structure here, um, just to shuffle, shuffle things around. So uh, I think my exercise here was uh, uh, showing that this is a symmetric monoidal category. Maybe you can just believe it for now. I think I, I, did, I did have an exercise here, which is my question. Um, is, is this thing Cartesian? Like, it's the Cartesian product on top and bottom, and it's just copy, right? I mean, I, I'm, I'm doing Cartesian structure on both of them. Is this a Cartesian product in the category of lenses, which we just showed was, in fact, a category, whose objects are these pairs of sets, or, you know, pairs of objects in a Cartesian category? <laughs> pairs of sets, and whose morphisms are these lenses. Is this the Cartesian product? So I think it's, uh, I don't know, we, uh, I think we could give a six minutes to, to play around with this question, try and see, yes or no, is it the Cartesian product? And then I'm, I'm, for some reason, this no longer like stays open and I have to hang out here and tap it periodically, so. Talk amongst yourselves. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Because I, I like it, algebraically checks out, makes sense. Yes. I understand why you would do it, but I want an intuition. And so when we came to the war machine stuff, you can come up with some examples quite easily. And yes. What I was thinking of was um, uh, latest the outfit you're wearing that influences things like whether and if your friend is suddenly really like that jumper. Right. And then the, you know, you update and you get a new you get a new outfit out and Very nice. outputs are like the thing you add to the outfit or the things you take away from the outfit. Nice. Um, and that's all fun and it's easy to come up with yeah. examples like that for a normal machine. A general lens the right. a more difficult lens to compose. I wanted some kind of just like a silly thing. That then made sense how these things kind of lie Right. Uh, so, right. So, um, uh, the silliest lenses are the wiring diagrams themselves because they just push around the values, if you think about it. And I'll make that very formal very soon. Um, and then composing those lenses corresponds to nesting the wiring diagrams, which is really quite cool. And that's going to be sort of our. And that's where we're, where we're going to end this. So that's going to be the main thing. So I think if you, if you understand that, I think you'll understand lens. But that that is pure lens composition, is nesting of wiring diagrams, and and then you can add in other junk, right? But there's a very there's a very real sense in that if all you know is that you have a lens, um, then all you can write down is a wiring diagram. So. so. And then, and then composing the systems in the line diagrams is also lens composition. So that's on my next slide. So, um, and if you want a lot more, uh, you can check out my book, which is linked. It's also on my website, davidjazz.com. And then there's like, in the first chapter, there's like a lot of examples. Thank you. Cheers. So. No, but you can if you want. It's kind of, 
if you think about the top being backwards and the forward being for and the bottom being forwards, it kind of is the thing you would expect. It turns out. Yep. Yeah. I'm realizing like lenses because they update, yeah, yeah. they're not really comparable. They're but not just like, perspectives, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but perspectives and context. So I'm going to ask you how many talks like perspectives that we bring in. Like they look at something, yeah. but in a different, like say, right, in a different context. Uh -huh. Is there anything like that that they can um, sometimes you could talk about things appearing in context as like the, the keyword to look up would be sheaves. Oh, sheaves. Because they're, they're sort of, you have this category of context and you have situations that take place in variable context like over them. Yeah, like an algebraic geometry. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Um, oh, I guess I, I can give us a few more minutes. I don't know. Anyone have an answer? Yes, no, maybe? Oh, no? No. <laughs> any, any yeses here? Anyone thinks it is? All right. So, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, does, one of, does one of my notes want to explain why it's no? Oh, uh, yeah. That's fun. <laughs> I guess if you write down um, the projection map to either side, um, you have like A plus cross B plus to A plus, but you need uh, A plus cross B minus to A plus. Yeah, so. I think that's pretty reasonable. Is that how you were thinking about it? What was your argument? I think just that like if you try to write down Right, right. So these are two. These are two good uh, answers for the sort of dual ways to present the Cartesian structure. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So this is um, this is uh, not a Cartesian product. It is a bona fide monoidal product, even though every can component of it was Cartesian somehow. There is a Cartesian product of lenses uh, in sets, by the way. <gasps> which uh, is actually what you'd guess if you just thought that the forward direction is set functions and the backwards direction is set op functions. But it's not so obvious, which is to say that it's actually Cartesian product in the, in the bottom and co-product in the top, um, which is fun. But it, uh, uh, I'm not, you know, uh, yeah. So yeah, yeah, you can see that by like, if you tried to do the, uh, the, the duplicate um, thing, which would go from A, you know, uh, a plus A minus would the duplicate would go to A plus times A plus A minus times A minus and the forward direction is fine you can duplicate but in the backwards direction you're taking A minus times A minus going to A plus well now you have a problem but there's a uh, you know there are in fact interesting things that uh, like a co-monoid in this this category is actually can be quite interesting but uh, I'm not going to cover this. Anyway, so it's not a Cartesian product. Really is a monodal product. So let's see what we can do with these. The main point is that now we can describe how to compose systems using one, lens one composition. Question, please. I'm sorry? One question on the, on the uh, uh, sure. monodal stuff. So um, is it possibly semi-Cartesian? I'm sorry? If, if the... Um, uh, if it's uh, semi-Cartesian, um, yes, I believe it is semi-Cartesian because the uh, the uh, the lens one one. Um, oh, sorry, <laughs> is it? It's not semi-Cartesian. We we actually did this as an exercise. Excuse me. Um, remember that the lens one one. What is a lens from a plus a minus to one one? It's a function from a plus to a minus. So there could be lots of those. So it's very much. It's not semi-Cartesian either. Oh, yeah. Is it closed? It is closed. Uh, sorry, it is. Uh, uh, it is. It is. Uh, it is closed. Yes. Um, uh, and uh, the 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 bottom things are the are the lenses as they would have to be by our computation of maps out of one. But uh, the top things are I forget what they are. Um, yeah. 
It is close. In fact, this category, like uh, the category of lenses has a lot of structure. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to go on here. So, okay, so this is all we need to compose systems, so it's this tensor. The tensor lets us bring together two systems and have them not interact, right? So if I tensor two systems together using this definition, what you could see is that they would just, I would have both of their states, both of their inputs, both of their outputs, and they would just update simultaneously, and it wouldn't mix at all. But then I could take this wiring diagram here, and maybe I'll, I'll uh, write this in a different way here. I could take this wiring diagram here, and it's gonna take my two boxes, and one of my boxes outputs a B, and inputs an A, and the other one outputs an A, and inputs a B and a C. Well. <laughs> and so now, um, I forget who asked me the question about how do you know where the boxes are. You know where the boxes are because of where you put the tensor product in this formula here on this side. Okay, so now I can take my two systems and I can tensor them together like this. And then I can compose, so what that has its codomain being um, A, B here and B times C over A. Why? Because this system here had inputs uh, A and outputs B, so it was a lens into AB. And this one here had inputs B and C and outputs A, so it was a lens into this, B times C over A. And this uh, uh, wiring diagram takes that as input, and it wires them together to give a new interface, C over A. And if I write out the lens composition uh, here, where again U1 and E1 are just like functions of the correct signature, and we use lens composition as previously defined, you will find that it actually does give you that one. Yeah. So I'll leave it to you all to check for yourselves that you believe it. But that's uh, how we end up using them. So uh, I want to say a little more about this. But this is the basic idea. One thing I'll say is that, um, uh, yeah, okay, now we're going to go on and we're going to see that this, there's a few other things we can say. We can say precisely which lenses are the wiring diagrams. And we can, from this, we'll be able to get like our action of wiring diagrams on systems. And this gives us sort of a, uh, the point of view, if you, if you know these terms, is you get an algebra for an operat. You have an operat of wiring diagrams, of nesting wiring diagrams, and you have an algebra for it and that lets you fill the boxes with systems. And we do that only using lens composition, which is nice. Okay, so the point, one point to make here is that the, uh, the construction of lenses and all these things we did only used a Cartesian structure. So I was working with sets and functions, but secretly I could have been working with any category with finite products, because all I used was that I had the Cartesian product and I could take duplicates and I could move those, move the boxes through the copies, right? I could take copies, I could take deletes, I could move the boxes through the copies. That's the Cartesian structure. Um, so, our theorem is that for any category, we have any category with finite products, we have a category of lenses in that category. And the objects of those lenses, I sometimes like to call arenas, um, just to give them a name. Um, and sort of you can think of those as the, 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 you know, the things, the places things can happen. Um, the objects have A plus and A minus, A plus in the bottom, A minus on the top, and a morphism is lens, and they compose using lens composition. And if we have any product-preserving functor between two, we can apply it both in the top and the bottom, roughly speaking, to get the, uh, uh, a functor on the category of lenses. Um, and that's because if we just push the functor through the definition in both places, the, the signature, it will push through the signature as well because the signature is like A plus times B minus to A minus right, with the top of the lens, if I apply a functor that preserves products to that, I get f of a plus times f of, a mi f of b minus to f of a minus. So we get a lenses go to lenses along Cartesian functors. So this lets us change what kind of category our lens is in. And we're going we're gonna to make use of this because what happens if we take lenses in the simplest Cartesian categories there are, namely the free Cartesian categories. So a free Cartesian category on a single object, we're going to we're going to do that. It's called the category of arities sometimes, which is how I like to think of it. Um, it is the, uh, the Lebeer theory for the theory with no uh, 
anything, <laughs> um, uh, but a single sort. Um, so what is it? Um, uh, it, it, it turns out that it's the opposite of the category of finite sets, but I want to write it in a certain way, which is expressive, right? So we have a single object X, but then it also has finite products. So we can take the product of this with itself and over and over again. And in fact, for any, any set, finite set F, we can take the power of our single object we started with X, right? And now let's think of what a map between these two things are. It's a free category with finite products. So, the products. so the only maps I can do are the ones I can build out of the product structure, which are the projections, right? And the universal property, which lets me do symmetries as well. So it turns out that in fact, if I have any map of finite sets, I can get a map going in the opposite direction, which is the one that, that, that is gonna, let's say I, my map of finite sets was something like this. And then I have this. Suppose that this was my map of finite sets like this. This is F prime and this is F, right? This is my map F. Right, the one I get going back is roughly speaking, so F star, roughly speaking, is going to take in three elements of X or in here, so this is like, let's say one, two, three, and this is one, two, let's say, right? It takes in the, uh, sorry, the two elements of X, X1, X2, and it's gonna give me three elements of X, and it's going to be, I'm going to take this one, this is a substitution in, uh, if, if you were following Owen's talk right before this one. Um, we're going to take the first variable here and we're going to substitute it in for the first one up there, so that's going to be x1. We're going to take it the second variable here and we're going to substitute it for the first one there, that's going to be x1. And then we're going to take the third variable here and we're going to substitute it for the second there, so that's going to be x2. So now, as you can see, I have this, this expression on the right is a formal expression, right? Those are formal variables. In fact, the only thing I really have is this F telling me what I would do. The projections, by the way, are given by the inclusions from one point into two points, right? And the diagonal is given by the map from two points to one point. Okay? So um, if I want, the, what is the universal property of this category? It's that I take that formal expression on the right and I turn it into an actual expression in whatever category I'm in. Like I turn it into an actual function that actually does that. That's the universal property. That's what makes this the free Cartesian category. So uh, my definition is that a wiring diagram is a lens in the free Cartesian category. And in general, if you want to label the wires by different types, you would use the free Cartesian category on that set of types. But I, I'll just ignore that for now. And so the idea is that such a wiring diagram, I should note that it's really like an operatic way to think here. So it's going to, a wiring diagram has multiple inner boxes. So we're going to take all of those inner boxes, we're going to tensor them up, and then we're going to map to the outer box. So the inner ports go on the top of the, uh, of the inner box, they're the, they're the, back, the, the backwards direction of the, of the domain here. So it's inside to outside. The top is the port inputs, the bottom is the outputs. And, uh, and what we get is these two things here, a map like this. So why is this a wiring diagram, in fact? Well, we have to remember that everything in the category of verities is dual to the category of finite sets. So when we take the product in the category of verities, we end up disjoint unioning these finite sets of sort of indexing, in a way, which, you know, are, are, if we imagine are the elements of our formal, you know, object X, are like x1, x2, x3, those are indexed by a set. And when we, when we multiply x to the f with x to the f prime, we get something that's indexed by x to the f plus f prime, because the indices could come from either one or the other. Right? And so everything gets reversed. So what we get is something, this is sometimes called a prism, by the way, if you know optics, because like the optics people love puns. Um, it's the opposite of a lens, right? So it's a prism, it's, you know, a focus, it splits, whatever. All right, so uh, it goes, it, everything here is exactly the same as it was, except I drew it backwards and where times has become plus. So now we go from B plus, I'm sorry, I could have written the details to say, but we go from the box, the output wires of the output box, this is in the bottom here, right? Over here, and we go over, and we choose one of the sum over here. So this is like a backwards version 
I wrote it up here. This is what's happening on the forward thing. This forward direction here becomes dualized into this here. It goes backwards. And similarly at the top, we take here and we send it to a disjoint union of all these. It's exactly dual to what a lens was. By the way, that's, that's this part, which comes from here, using these, and this goes to that, except it's backwards. So it takes all these, and it goes into some here. And now we can read off rules for drawing these wiring diagrams from the fact that these are functions, right? So the bottom one says this, every output, outer output B plus, because B plus is, this, is the set of outer outputs, comes from exactly one inner output, which is called W plus B plus, right? And W plus B plus is an element of the disjoint union of all the B plus I's. In other words, the, I, the, the disjoint union of all the um, output ports of all the inner boxes, right? So every output, uh, outer output comes from exactly one inner output. The second one says that every inner input comes from either, right, that's this plus over here, either an inner output, which is all of these, inner output, or an outer input, which is one of these. And those are the two, those are the rules for, for drawing the wiring diagrams, and they correspond exactly to the fact that this is a lens in the free Cartesian category. Um, so uh, this is a little, maybe a little tricky if you haven't seen this free Cartesian category thing Again, but it's a, a, if you want a slower version of this, I'll say this is, this is the, the, what we're doing today is sort of the content of chapter one of my book, which you can find on my website. Um, so it's, it's, it's done much slower. So, okay, which, yeah. Um, okay, so uh, composition of these wiring diagrams is by nesting. So I, I really, I think we're gonna take another uh, exercise moment here, because this is like super important. Like write down the nested diagram. Here's this. Here's these. Right. I did one for you. You can do whichever examples you want. Right. But here, I take that diagram on the left here. All right. Here's a wiring diagram, and then here's another one. And the thing to note about this one is that it has two inputs and two outputs. And this one on the inside has two inputs and two outputs. So I can plug this whole box inside this. Right. I can nest it inside. And when I do, I get this whole thing, where the gray, that gray box here, which I'm highlighting now, this thing was this box. But I've erased it, if you will. The composite would have that erased, right? And so what I want you to do is to write out these two wiring diagrams in this way, as these two functions on finite sets, Right? And then compute the lens composite for them and check that it actually works. And I'm pretty sure that's going to take us to the end of the time if we do that. Um, so let's see. Uh, yeah, that's effectively the end of part one. Uh, <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, oh, I want to say that uh, uh, just because I, I think I, uh, after I'll do that, I'll just clear up with a little fasting. But, but uh, Owen mentioned symbolic lenses in the talk just before this. And those are, so here is the Levere, here is lenses in the Levere theory with nothing, right, of no symbols, no axioms, nothing. But if you do it in the Levere theory with symbols and axioms, you can put those and they can decorate your wiring diagrams and you can use the equations to like reason about your wiring diagrams. So you get the symbolic lenses that Owen was talking about are lenses in the Levere theories of those algebraic theories he was talking about. Okay, so I'm gonna let you all do this. This is a super good exercise. Remember that the lens composition in the free Cartesian category, right, is exactly the same as the other one, right? But it's done um, in this, for the set thing, which one comes from, which variable comes from which variable, right? Another thing I'll say is that it might be easier to write it out using like this, in which case the other thing to note is that the only functions you can write down in the free Cartesian category are duplications, deletions, and shufflings. So a lens in which the, own, the functions involved in it only duplicate, delete, and shuffle the variables around, that's a wiring diagram. It just tells you how to rearrange all the data that's flowing on those wires, if you will. 
Um, so I'm going to let you all do this, and then uh, I'll say a few words in closing, and then we'll be done. Yeah. Uh, I might have just missed when you said this, but did you get the, the type signature for the backwards pass to the bottom line? Um, the type signature for the backwards pass. Uh, like on the previous slide. Yeah. Um, so on the previous slide, uh, the, the fact that we have the pluses, so the fact that everything sort of flipped, and instead of times we have plus, is because this is, a, if you want to think about it, this is happening in the exponent of x. Like, you, if you did this and then mapped into x, everything would be go backwards, and then it would be a real lens. Yeah. And then, uh, and that's the, that's, yeah. Where, and, yeah. And so, uh, every, everything here is just like on the, maybe I should have written it, I don't know. <sighs> I don't know, it was working perfectly and then it stopped doing. I, might, I, I probably should have written it instead like, I'll just move it around. Like with the, the map going backwards like this, so it's like very clear that it is actually exactly the same as a lens, but it's like, backwards. Oh, the sharing is off? Okay, well, let me just finish this and then I'll put it back on. Yeah, maybe that's a little better. The maps go backwards. We're in the opposite of the category of finite sets. But now you can see that they're arranged in the same way I had been arranging everything before. Uh, yes, I, yes, I did. I just, I actually just uh, said that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, very cool. Um, so first, yeah, I come here, I have to be on tapping duty. I don't, I don't know what it is. I think I'll unplug it because like it was fine before I plugged it in. That's weird. Was it charging? It was, it, did, okay. it charged a bunch. Powerful charger. Powerful charger. Yeah, so an arena is now I'm thinking three things. So a, a finite set, A plus, like normal. Then A zero, which I'm thinking of as the set of states of your box. And then A minus is a, a function dependent from, function on that. So so you can have different collections of input wires. Depending on that. Depending on the state of your box. Okay. But you always output the same thing. But you always output the same thing. And then a wiring guide, uh, like a yeah, lens, or really a prism here, is a function from B plus to A plus. Mm -hmm. So and a function forward on a function zero. forward on state. And then a function backwards. And then a function backwards, which for each state of the inner box, you get a map from the, of the dependent, uh, appropriately dependent what you think. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. And then the monoidal product is um, Cartesian for both of these, or not uh, co-product for both of these, but then product. It's not Cartesian. It's not Cartesian. It's the, the, the Cartesian, monoidal no, product. No, Cartesian product of the middle thing. Why is that? So you're thinking, you're saying that the I can... of the boxes Oh, it's a mode for each of them. Exactly. Very clever. Ooh, I like it. I like it. Does it compose? I'll, I'll, I'll uh, check. I'll check. You know, I wonder, can you get this as like lenses? Can the, is this um, lenses for like some kind of free index category? I don't know. That's what, yeah, that was my hope it would turn out to be lenses and, you know, you take a free Cartesian category. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, that was my hope, but I, it, it might. Because like, what is the uh, the the indexed category thing you might like? Right, right. So a 
What? What? How's? Just... Oh, it's. You have a. It each a pair well, of this an is a poly... a, Like a zero and a minus together are a polynomial. Mm -hmm. And this yeah. is not quite a polynomial. It's a little weird, but um, yeah. I wonder if you could get like. I wonder how you, because like, the backwards. The forwards part looks like this, and the backwards part is like that. It's like forwards part is like a pair of nouns, but then you also have the data. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes, you can. You can do that. So it's so. <laughs> Uh, if we were doing <laughs> right, so this is a Are you familiar with this? Is this a scroll bar? So this is the, right, so this is the growth and deconstruction of the pointwise opposite. Um, and so as you can see here, the way it works, right, is that on the bottom you just take a manifold, but then in the top you take that domain, the codomain, here, and you pull it back. So if you pull it back, it's kind of clear. That's why it's not a relation. This, right? In particular, this is in fact a pair, this pullback. Imagine if I'm actually a pair. This is actually the arrow category. Then, then this is actually pairs of pair plus and a B minus. Pulling back the B minus over this B minus that's over here, we pull it back over here. It's like it's pairs of an A plus and a B minus. I mean, map out of them. So it is the same thing. And there's a simple, the, there's a special in, in the exercise. There's a special collaboration called the simple collaboration. Or a special index category. Oh, sorry. Yeah. It's graphing the constraint. If you take this, then you get some of the access. Oh, wait. So you're like changing the But if you want. Dependent lenses, you can do it with the whole slice category. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, it's a bit better. Yes. But yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah.
I think it's very nice that, you know, at the so moment, like, you that's are, is that, like, if you're in a, a category, if you're in a category of class, it's like, like sort of um, X to the F, right? as a uh, function, like, it's, it's a good, for me, it's a good, like, reality check that this is really, like, commercial applications who want it. For all, you're showing it to people who want it. Yeah, it's like, it's, it's universal for all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the, that's the definition of the idea. It's a problem. It's a consulting game. It's a limit of the diagram. Cool. So, I think that you know, at least some subjects of category theory are getting involved. Uh, so, it's almost like a Yeah. I think, yeah. I are there like particular areas that you guys are Yeah, yeah. How many people are doing all this chat? Is there like. It'll be over soon. The usually of soundness of economic mechanisms. They're like, especially, we work so fast in the system, but the idea is that. Uh, as soon as you're done, you're ready to take off. Yeah. Yes, David is, but I'm leaving him. I'm, 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 I think I'm going to take the night off and stay out late on a, on a different night because I'm definitely yeah. a little uh, tired. I know, I know. So I'll be done. It's like this, right? I can say, yeah, 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 yeah. Someone comes to us and you know, they say, I'm going to solve it. I have a new problem. Uh, you have a new mechanism of that sort. That would be But you could also say it's just one. And then you axiomatize those in terms of like certain inequalities. I think it's a some kinds of agents. By the way, I do write about this in equilibrium, but outside of this bound, no, it doesn't work anymore. Like, the, 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 the proof is there. You know, all the ways that I'm going to do that. But to be honest, Jules was really dissatisfied about this, but I think he felt this is a good People are not really paying for the model, right? People are paying for terror time. If I think for terror time, like, oh, yes. I think practice. The model like encompassing everything, the escrow would be like a, I don't know, five hundred thousand dollars And in fact, it actually got yeah, that, that doesn't include the amount of right, um, time. Uh, yeah. So I think that's all our time. Thank you all for coming, learning about lenses. So this is one one slide I want to talk about uh, after the end here, I guess. But uh, so we just looked at simple lenses, but there are lots of different other kinds of functor lenses. Functor lenses. Uh, my name it's not a great name. If you have a better one, tell me. For uh, for David Spivak's notion of lenses that are the graph and deconstruction of the pointwise opposite of an index category. And depending on which index category you take, you get all these different flavors. So the second one is stochastic with also, you can also have rewards and other kinds of monads. You could have costs, you could have non-determinism, you could have all the, any kind of monad you want, as long as it's a commutative monad. Um, and then in the bottom, you can also have dependent, and this one's kind of fun. So the systems of ODEs are here expressed as sections of the tangent bundle on a manifold. And so these compose in this way. And it turns out that all lenses actually are like this kind of diagram where you have the span of something and the left leg is special in one way and the right leg is special in another way. In this case, the bottom is an identity on the left leg and the, the right leg is a pullback square. So that's it. That's the rest of the talk that we didn't get to. And uh, yeah, that's it. So there's a lot more in lenses. All these different kinds of systems come for their own kind of lens. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Uh, it's, on, it's on my meeting list. Yeah, I don't know. I didn't go back to the wrong. I oh, didn't intend to, but... Can you just curry everything? Oh, okay. So it's just... Like curry. Yeah. 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 Yeah.